Ladies and gentlemen, rotate your bonsai tree, release your brood of tree frogs, and pour out your soul to the moon, because it's time to talk tall to me. I'm Omen Said. And I am Nick McGill. Together we are Feckless Moans. And this is Talk Tall to Me, the podcast where we week by week break down a single song of the Jethro Tull oeuvre (laughs) in chronological order. Every week is the next song on the album that we are focusing on. And it just so happens that this week, Omen, what are we listening to and talking Tull about? We are talking Tull about the second song on the disc, Nothing to Say. On the disc benefit, the song is Nothing to Say. This week, we're talking about the second track on the disc, Benefit, Nothing to Say. Nick, Omen. the song is called Nothing to Say, and for the first time, I have almost nothing to say about this song. I I really, I feel like my mouth is full of clay over here. It's tough. There's not a whole lot. I couldn't find a whole lot in my research. Other than a really cool site that I think I'm going to be tapping into fairly regularly now. Okay. It is, you uncovered something in your Tolkiology research. I, I did. It was a chicken bone. It was. I'm going to save it for later. So I found some stats on the song Nothing to Say. Okay. Hit me with them. And this is in particular live performances. Interesting. It has been played a total of 53 times in live performances by two artists. Two artists? Yep. Who? The first time it was played in concert was September 2nd, 1993, by Jethro Tull at the Stowe Performing Arts Center in Stowe, Vermont, United States. 1993? Yeah. It took them 23 years after they released it to play it live? For kind of a a minor track off of an album that they didn't play much Beyond. Right. And we know that Ian Anderson wasn't overly, overly fond of this album. Yeah, I think so. Interesting. Okay, mm-hmm. who was the other artist it was played by? The most recent time it was played was March 3rd, 2019, <gasps> by Martin Lancelot Barr mm-hmm. at Moe's Alley, Santa Cruz, California, USA. Lancelot. It has been Rescue played. me from the burning stake. It has been played five times in concert by Jethro Tull and 48 times by Martin Barr. Whoa, wait. You are... I'm... My my mind... Wait, it's been played... It's it's been played five times by Ian Anderson live? Yeah, by Tull. Wow. Yep. What a shocking disparity. Yeah, it was played 20 times in 2017 alone. By bar. I'm assuming the numbers I have is just the, the general amount played. Well, it must be. It must be. I mean, it, that's that's four times as many times as Ian Anderson has ever played it. So you, the, more, the majority of that has got to be Martin Barr. You know, what I'm seeing here is in 93, it was played once. And in 95, it was played four times. I'm assuming that was the five times by Tull. Wow. And then... Everything else has been Martin Barr. Yep. I wonder why Martin Barr likes it so much. It looks like he started playing it in 2016. That's the earliest date on here for the other numbers. I mean, it it is a, it is a good... It is a good... Um, it's a good... It's a good 
Let me start that whole sentence again. It's a good guitar piece. It is. And he was a part of it. It was one of his songs. You know? Totally. He originated that guitar track to it. And he is it it's clear that he is not his investment in it is very different than Ian Anderson's. Clearly. Totally. Yeah. So I let's let's talk about some things that we that we can know for certain. Sure. Let's talk about some known certainties, Nick. Let's let us do that. Not not the um not the dark matter and and neutron explosions which make up the body of this song but um but some of the musical stylings yeah definitely what do you got well so i don't know if we actually talked about this when we were talking about about the previous track last week when we were talking about with you there to help me but ian anderson seems to be doing this new thing on this album where he's doubling his own voice like it sounds like Mm. they recorded a track of him singing and then recorded another track of him singing and yep. and put them directly on top of each other. It contributes to the um the kind of dreamy feeling of this album. Yeah, very much. And it's not it's not necessarily harmonization either. No, it, until the very end of this song. Actually, my the, the part of this song that I enjoy the most is is toward the end where he starts doing those harmonies with himself. Mm. But it's so funny that vocal doubling style is something that I don't really associate with rock music. It's like that's a technique that that rappers use more more often, at least m- that I'm more aware of. Yeah. So it's really interesting to hear in this context. I think in terms of rap, it's more f- for complexity and delivery as opposed to this feels more layering. Does that make does that make sense? I I feel like. Yeah. I mean, we should say that while we are not experts on Jethro Tull, we are certainly not experts in the history of rap and hip hop. Or or any real bit of rap or hip hop, to be honest. Not not um, at all. Um I yeah. do I do really enjoy the digital underground, but that is a recent discovery for me. I also really enjoy the Wu Tang clan. Um but again, really recent discovery for me the discovery is recent the artists are not correct yeah <laughs> correct so how do you how do you feel about this song it's so funny i think this is one of those songs that i've never really thought about very much it's always one that i've listened to and kind of like jammed along my head a little mm-hmm. bit too but it doesn't it doesn't strike me emotionally i've never read the lyrics until 30 seconds ago hmm and and I am I am left confused, left wanting. <laughs> I'm I'm left wanting information about what the heck they mean. Agreed. Yeah, I didn't realize that I didn't need to read the lyrics. I didn't realize that I had, aside from like one or two of his really weird pronunciations, I knew the lyrics to this song. That's so funny. I had some misheard lyrics on this. Yes. Climb a tower of freedom, paint your own deceiving sign. Did did not think that that's what it was. Climb a tower of freedom, paint your own deceiving sign. I thought it was I'm a child of freedom. Oh, interesting. That also makes sense, though. It makes probably more sense. <laughs> For me, it was every morning pressure forming all around my eyes. Every morning, crash a farming all around my eyes. Instead of, I, my best guess was every morning, crabs are forming all around <laughs> oh my <eyes>. Why? <laughs> I Why? thought it was. I, I wasn't sure mean? if it was euphemistic or if it was like eye boogers or what. I don't know. I just. I have a really horrible image of like being swarmed by sea crabs tiny, first thing in the morning. Tiny little crabs, adorable, cleaning up your Dear eye boogers. Dear God. Yeah. Wow, I'm going to sleep with my crab protective glasses on from now. Yeah. Oh, God. oh absolutely. Yeah. So, so lyrically, it is, it is very vague. It's really vague. It's so, yeah. it, like, it's so interesting that the song is called Nothing to Say because it li- it doesn't say anything says nothing yeah it's very it's this is the most enigmatic song 
written by Ian Anderson that we have discussed thus far. Yeah, absolutely. And I am, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if it is, if it is a direct response to something that he has experienced that he, that if it, if it is, he is directly speaking to someone and we just don't know. But it's so coded that, that it's not meant to be understood by anyone else. Right. It can't be deciphered. That's what it feels like. That's what, honestly, that's what it feels like. It feels like it's, it does feel like there, because there are so specific, there are such specific references to things and, and lines it's not my power to criticize or to ask you to be blind to your own pressing problem and the hate you must unwind that sounds very personal the whole first stanza every day there's someone asking what is there to do should i love or should i fight is it all the same to you no i say i have the answer proven to be true but if i were to share it with you you would stand to gain and i to lose what does that mean though it's so it's it, it's very very specific and yet it's entirely opaque why would i give you free advice i mean that 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 is that is how i translate it but what the heck it means what is that what is the context that that falls into and also the line you know. would you would stand to gain and i to lose i mean it's it's very interesting because it feels very this so Ian Anderson has a streak of cynicism running yeah. through his work. We could say, we have said, I just, I just said it. <laughs> yeah, we see a smattering of it further down the line, but yeah. this whole album feels kind of like an origin point, to be honest. Of cynicism? Yeah, like it, it just feels so dark. I think that I think that we see the the seeds of cynicism earlier in the first two albums but this song in particular just feels completely overwhelmed with that feeling to the point where to the point to the point where it's it's totally inaccessible yeah the song structure is also very strange it's not it's not really got a verse or a chorus if you look at the yeah. verses they're they're not the same size there's not really a bridge of any kind mm-hmm. it's just kind of like this it's just kind of like this um this sad ramble a sample a sample it's a, a sampling it's the the closest <laughs> i got we... a sample at starbucks this morning yeah yeah it's probably probably just bitter and black right yeah it was a sample of cynicism yeah the the closest we get to a a running theme is yeah oh i couldn't bear it so i've got nothing to say nothing to say no just because i have a name well i've got nothing to say nothing to say i went your way 10 years ago and i've got nothing to say nothing to say yeah that sort of acts as as a a proto chorus right yeah it's it's come it's come out of the primordial soup of music this almost feels like the sort of thing that like you would write in in your in your sad journal like just just to sort of get stuff out you know yeah maybe while you're doing your morning pages or as some sort of journaling therapy all of which i highly recommend to everyone out there get it out but and i it almost i almost i almost imagine there's a point when they're like oh we need one more song for the album and he's like and he's like oh i've got this stuff right here that's kind of what I, I was going to say. Martin Lancelot Barr is like, great, I'll play the guitar while you sing it. <laughs> and Ian's like, what else would we do? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a great idea. Maybe Clive Bunker should play the drums. <laughs> it, it, it turned into to, to, uh, Paul McCartney. <laughs> yeah, Paul McCartney, that's right. <laughs> and Ringo, play the drums. <laughs> I know. What's that line from... Have you seen Yellow Submarine? No, I haven't. There's this great bit where Ringo has exited the submarine and is like floating in the ocean. And one of them says, Ringo's out there. And the other one says, he always has been, hasn't he? (laughs) (laughs) Where is the Jethro Tull movie? Classic British humor. We saw it last week. We We saw it was the vampire (laughs) music video. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> no, it was like, that was two weeks ago, I think. No. Oh, yes. No, it was last. Was it? Yeah. Uh, you're malfunctioning. What was that one for? Uh, that was. Um... It wasn't with you there to help me. No, no, no. It was. Uh... That was like a month ago. Who can remember? It was for they toured a. It was on the it was sweet slip dream. Stream, sweet dream. It was, yeah. It was sweet dream. Yeah. So that was that was about a month ago. But to go three hours back to your point, it de- it definitely feels. <laughs> we we took a we took a wrong turn in Albuquerque. <laughs> we re ramble. We samble. The it does very much feel like a. It feels like a high schooler in his in his elective English lit course writing bad poetry. It also feels mm-hmm. like like it wasn't necessarily meant to be on an album song. It feels like one of those almost throwaway like this if they had one more song or or if one other one were just a little bit better, this very well could have been a super obsolete uh bonus track on an album. Interesting. I feel yeah it feels it feels so personal yeah it feels so and it it's weird it's weird to imagine it i mean like i'm not actually surprised to hear that ian anderson has played it a total of the whopping five times yeah live because it feels like a very weird thing to stand on stage in front of thousands of people and sing i've got nothing to say yeah like those like literally those lyrics that's weird once in 93 and then four times in 95 and then just never again and i yeah. i would be shocked if there was a year where they didn't tour so that's a lot of yeah yeah that's i mean they even if they skipped every other year that's still a lot of years to tour so nick we were talking a little bit last week with uh with you there to help me about the the kind of the idea that this is really a a pupating album an yes. album of pupating that's right a transitional album where they're 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 on the cusp of finding their their sound Mm. and i just wanted to i just wanted to like look at other albums that were released that year oh good idea yeah because i think i think it's interesting to hear like what else is there so to remind everyone this is 1970 correct yeah so the top 10 rock albums obviously that is a um what's the thing not objective that is a subjective uh designation is this a rolling stone or I, I, we haven't had fantastic luck with rolling stones so we'll see it's digitaldreamdoor.com <laughs> let's let's not tell anyone that. wow you, uh, you 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 dig for those sources don't you i wonder if it's the top selling let me see if uh let me see if i can make up that if it's like top selling albums. i would i would trust wikipedia over digitaldreamdoor.com what do you have against digitaldreamdoor.com where your digital dream doors come true <laughs> i mean i have been yearning for a digital dream door at least a good one <laughs> um you're gonna edit this part out right yeah you're like no Oh, okay, I think this is a fairly reliable source. Well, so it look it looks like I have um looks like I have like okay, so here we have the top maybe these are the top selling rock albums. Anyway, some of the top albums. <laughs> a selection of the top albums. Yeah. These are albums that came out in 1970. <laughs> and and someone yeah, we'll and someone that. liked them. <laughs> someone liked them. All right, let's start this whole section again. So Nick, here are here are some of the other albums that came out in 1970 by other big bands, uh, other big you know rock bands. Yeah. So, Paranoid by Black Sabbath. Okay, big album for them. I'm not actually familiar. I don't really know Black Sabbath. Oh, that's um, let's see what was on Paranoid. M- my older brother used to listen to Sabbath on the reg it, when we were in high it school. It seems like an older brother kind of thing. It, yeah, I feel like it was. Bridge Over Troubled Water by Simon and Garfunkel. Okay. So if you put those two together, what do you get? Jethro Tull. <laughs> the baby of Simon and Garfunkel and Ozzy Osbourne. 
Nick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, let's go back. Let's do a super callback. Black Sabbath guitarist Tony Iommi auditioned to take the spot of Mick Abrahams. Whoa! Ooh. Look who's laughing now. I'm I'm not sure. Martin Lancelot Barr. Well, he plays nothing to say. <laughs> yeah. After the Gold Rush by Neil Young, the Plastic okay. Ono Band by John Lennon. Don't know what that is. Um, Moon Dance by Van Morrison. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Big that. Cosmos Factory, Creedence Clearwater Revival, Live at Leeds, The Who, Deja Vu by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. That is an amazing album. It's definitely safe to say, yeah, that's one of my favorites of theirs. It's definitely safe to say that that is a list of very solid albums. Well, and what I'm what I'm realizing they all have in common is, I mean, so I don't know some of these, but like the ones that I'm familiar at all with, these are bands that really have defined their sound yeah yeah and those those granted i'm i'm not familiar with the full discography like i am with tull but but those when i think of those albums i think of the sounds of those albums that's the sound that i think of for those bands correct yes totally and so putting so like benefit existing in the in the context of that kind of constellation of of music that's coming out i think it's it's easy to it's easy to see i think why rolling stone panned it yeah yeah that's valid but also remember we said last last episode this one sold this was the first tall album to sell over what like over a million, a million yeah that's true that's true so even though it was not reviewed well by Rolling Stone. But also we need to remember, like, when did those albums come out, that list that you gave us? Because this came out April. There, There's right. eight more months for those to come out. So, I mean, sure. yeah. maybe, maybe it wasn't a, a comparison of, well, look at the dearth of other really good albums that we have. Well, I mean, no, no, I don't think it, I don't think it was. I think it, but I think that like, in a in a world where those bands were playing, got it. Okay, you know, I think that Jethro Tull, I don't want to say struggling to find their sound. I would say processing their yeah. brilliance. Yeah, working working this, to get to that sound in this moment. Sure, it's inter- It's it's interesting. It's an interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting moment to observe. Yeah, regardless of the sound of the the specific album those bands in general Jethro Tull falls in the scope of those bands right and we acknowledge that yeah they were they were they were working some stuff out and right we and I'm I'm probably going to say this a couple more times we have the the benefit of knowing Ugh. the rest of Tull's work but yeah. <laughs> but this this dude from Rolling Stone was was working off of the the two albums prior to this, and that's it. Yeah. And it's a very different sound. And honestly, yeah. I've I would love to hear more music by Tull or anyone else that sounds like Benefit, but I never have. I don't think it exists. Yeah, yeah. I really think it's this unique moment. The closest thing is the Living in the Past album by Jethro Tull, which is a compilation. <laughs> right, 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 right. So musically, yes. How do you feel about this song? You know it. It doesn't. It doesn't transport me. No. It bathes me. It, in... it feeds you and tucks you in, kisses no. you on the forehead, but it will not transport you. It refuses. It will not love me. It's not my real dad. <laughs> you can't it, tell me it, what to do. It's, it, I feel warm when I listen to this song. You know what I mean? It's like a, mm. it's like a cozy, it's like a cozy sweater. It's like a cozy wrap. And I think we have, it's like an old shawl. I think we that have. You wouldn't wear out in public. It's an, it's an aged parka. It is an ancient sarong. <laughs> it is an, past its prime loincloth 
Nick, I asked you not to speak about my loincloths on the on the show. I, I, I've been asking you to replace it for years. <laughs> it it reveals more things than it covers. Did uh did you did you have a point at any point <laughs> during the last couple of minutes? I may have. It uh, that that feeling of warmth. I think we can attribute, at least in my opinion, one hundred percent to Martin's guitar for certain. I think everything else is so bitter or mournful that without that 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 guitar that's just a couple degrees warmer that really juxtaposes Ian's voice which for this song is kind of kind of flat line it's kind of he doesn't have a whole lot of range on this song but when you you we have the guitar working above his voice in this one. Oh, I couldn't bear it, so I've got nothing to say. And it kind of takes its own path. And it's it's really nice right. to hear, and and it works well in conjunction with it, but it also kind of has its own thing going on as well. I think it's it's a really decent. Yeah. It's a really. I think I don't want to I don't want to be so dramatic as to say that it saves the song, but it certainly makes it stand out more than if it were just a standard, kind of accompaniment guitar. Right. I do think that that another thing that kind of drives this song in an interesting way is Glenn Cornick. Like oh. he has that kind of recurring, you know, the guitar goes da dum um da dum da dum da dum da dum, and then he goes dum 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 dum. And it's really, and it always comes back to that, and you always hear that like dum 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 dum. Yeah, and it's really, it's. I don't know why that captures my attention so much. I think it's huh. maybe just that it's it's a signpost in this kind of wending uh, morass of music. Yeah. For some reason this time I I did not notice the bass all that much. And maybe that's huh. that's a sign of how maybe good he speak. is. Well, that is that is <laughs> <laughs> No, that is part of it. I think that I think that like the 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 Jethro Tull style of bass is a little bit like flying under the radar like i feel like Very i much. feel like that's i feel like that's what i don't know if that was like a an Ian anderson directive or just like what they discovered works uh-huh but yeah it does it's one of those things where you're like it's hard to identify sometimes but but without it it would be totally different yeah yeah absolutely i would i would be really interested if there were some way for us to hear a song without the bass and just just see how much it really does add. Well, we could get um we could get those uh those bass karaoke machines, you know, for bassists to to play bass to songs in a in a karaoke bar. Nick, I Nick, I do don't know what I'm. I don't do know, you know how that's. About. I don't know how that slipped my mind. I I feel like such a fool now. <laughs> so can I tell you a little uh, anecdote? Yeah, please. I was uh, I. I was playing bass in this bar, this karaoke <laughs> bar. <laughs> no, I was at I was um, doing some carpentry at a an off Broadway theater in New York, and um, one of the one of the other gentlemen there and I uh, talk a lot of nonsense, or rather, I talk a lot of nonsense, and he <laughs> um, listens and sometimes provokes me to talk more nonsense, and at one point. At one point, he, in the midst of all this nonsense, he said, he said, Owen, oh, you should, you should have like a podcast. I feel like you need a venue for all of this, for just all of these things that you're saying. And I, I said, I admitted that I'm, in fact, I have a podcast. And there was some general murmuring about that. <laughs> and then an hour later, so there was uh, that week when I was when I was there. There was a there was it was there was a new a new carpenter who's who it was her first week there, uh, very young, and you know learning the ropes. And at one point, 
we were talking about something and I and I said I started to conclude what I was saying by by saying as the old parable says and she straight cut in and said save it for the podcast omen <laughs> <laughs> I literally I couldn't I just closed my mouth and exited the room to my next to the my next appointment gotcha I was I was like dang and she thereby won the respect of all of the entrenched carpenters <laughs> on the crew and is now everyone's favorite person. So so that's great. So you you were under the assumption that by admitting you had a podcast, you would be elevated amongst the, the circle of, of carpenters that they would... Uh, I was not necessarily assuming that. I I was I my assumption was that it was going to confirm people's beliefs about me and the kind of person that I am. Do you think that that was actually needed? Like did they need that that extra confirmation? I don't think anyone needs anything but but they <laughs> you know it came up in conversation. Fair enough. I didn't want to be like I don't have a podcast. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm valid, yeah. Yeah. I'm proud of I'm proud of what we do here, Nick. Here at Feckless Moms. Here at Feckless Moms at the Feckless Moms Audio Network. So, Nick. Yeah, Omen. If this song were a type of spa treatment, what type of spa treatment would nothing to say be? It would be something very indirectly and vaguely named like <laughs> like a sea foam salt scrub lower back apportionment oh that's that's actually quite specific though i, I like but you don't I know like, what um, it is you don't know what you're actually getting right out right of right it. Yeah, like a Swedish sea salt ablution. Yeah. Oh, ooh, that sounds yeah. painful. And then they they actually do it to you. They actually give it to you. Right. And you feel no different. <laughs> and but it's and you you but it's you're very left, expensive. But it's very expensive, and you're left wondering like what just happened. Right. Yeah. Is this a spa? Is this a treatment which is offered at um, reputable spas? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Only high end. Oh. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And and people. Some people get it just because it's expensive, and some yeah, people get it totally because it sounds cool. They can brag about it. They can brag about it, and then and then there are repeat customers because they're like, maybe it didn't take the first time. Maybe I need to experience it right. again, <laughs> or maybe it's right. like a there's a build up to it, so maybe yeah. I just need to experience right, right. it a couple of times. Please, you know, yeah, this is the sort of thing you'll really feel the effects in like six to twelve months if you come back every week. Yeah, you need you need a couple of sessions under the belt before you feel anything from this. But it's oh, it, is, it, does, it is it is a does worthy happen, investment. It does happen below the belt. Absolutely. I mean, that's where the oh. lower back is. My my belt is is above I my think lower you back. You're wearing your belt wrong, Nick. <laughs> wow, this explains a lot about the shape of your trousers. <laughs> What else? What else do we want to say about this song, Nick? I'm... I I mean I, in general, in <laughs> in general, I like the song. I don't I don't hate it. Huh? How I, refreshing. I, I do... <laughs> That is false potatoes with how much I've been <laughs> praising so much the last like two months. Yeah. Except for seventeen and sweet dream, but right, right, right. I like the song. I really do. Yeah. But I, I also do think that it suffers from not having a really specific, I guess, story to tell or message. Or at least not telling it in an explicit way. Right. And and that is, and and maybe it's working as intended, you know, like this may just, maybe this song is not for us. Mmm, that's how it feels. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's how it feels. Well, I have nothing to say. I 
I think the only thing that can be said is please go rate, review, and subscribe. The, the, the usual thing. If you've got nothing to say, please say it with stars on the various platforms through which you listen to Talk Tall to Me. That's right. That is that is where that's where to do it. <laughs> you could also you could also take a piece of chalk and write the stars on your sidewalk. That's true. But please be sure to specify what it's for. So oh, yes. so when the mailman walks by and he's like, "Man, you know what? I could really use a new podcast to listen to. I've I've used all of Yo, mine. Oh wait, Nick. my shoes untied. Let me bend down. Oh my god, what is talk to me? What are all me? these stars? Yeah, yeah. It'd I be, bet that. It's, it'd be like the perfect Rube Goldberg moment of did you, uh, revelation. Did you know, Nick, that that actually um, 87% of our subscribers are um, male people, male I, officers? I don't think they're officers of anything. Male Car- officers carriers. of carriers. Male carriers. I, yeah. You know what? They, lo- they love our podcast. I did not know that, but it makes a lot of sense. It sure does. They have a lot of time. They do. They do, and it's a it's a lonely job. It's a lonely, thankless job. It. I never thank them. You know what? To all, would you say eighty seven or ninety seven? Eighty seven percent. To all eighty seven percent of our mail carrier listeners, thank you for what you do. Genuinely, thank you. I. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna give my mail carrier five stars. <laughs> Please rate and review your mail carrier and give them five stars. It'll make their day and it'll make our day. For the price of a cup of coffee a day, you too you can, sponsor can support a, a mail, mail carrier. Ca- <laughs> oh my god. Day Nick, what are we so what are we gonna be talking about? Uh, <laughs> what are we gonna be talking about next week? Next week is yes. one of the shortest songs on the album. It second is shortest. Second shortest by only a second. Uh, it is alive oh, and well shortest. and living in. No, two two forty three, and the other is two forty two. And then there's just trying to be, which is one thirty eight. Boom. Where's just trying to be? Track thirteen. Oh, bonus tracks. Bonus. Bonus tracks. So next week we will be listening to alive and well and living in, and until then. <clears throat> Next week we'll you come be down with an ague. I am, I am not alive and or well, <laughs> or living. And until then, I'm Omen Sade, and I am Nick McGill. We are Feckless Momes, and this is Talk Tall to Me. Talk Tull to Me is a proud member of the Feckless Moms Audio Network. (laughs) He always was, wasn't he?